If I leave everybody with anything, I wanna leave with the power of self-awareness. There are so many things that so many people do way better than me. Um, There are so many things I love to do, but I'm not that capable at it. There's so many things that I'm incredibly capable at, but I don't want to do. I think for everybody who's running a project right now, or just knowing the crowd, all the entrepreneurial spirit and thinkers that are listening to this podcast, the quicker you get comfortable with accepting yourself for who you are, and the quicker you navigate against your strengths and weaknesses, which doesn't mean don't try to build up your weaknesses, it means just be self-aware, know what you're capable of, communicate to that through that lens. I think it can bring a lot of happiness and a lot less anxiety, and I, I highly push that. Today's guest is Gary Vaynerchuk, better known as Gary V. He is the chairman of VaynerX and CEO of VaynerMedia and V Friends. He's also a five-time New York Times bestselling author and previously created the Wine Library, which is one of the first e-commerce platforms for alcohol in the early 2000s. In 2009, he co-founded VaynerMedia with his younger brother, AJ. And fast forward to today, the company services clients like PepsiCo, GE, Johnson & Johnson, and others. But this is a crypto podcast, and he is also the CEO of VFriends, which I mentioned before. And that's an NFT project that we'll dive into during this episode. Anyways, Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to meet you on here. Uh, but before we get into everything, I wanted you to tell me about one of the most interesting people in crypto you've met or talked to in the past 12 months, and what did you learn from them? Oh, that's fun. Um, gosh, there's so many. I just, I'm just coming up <laughs> on, which is um, when I launched Be Friends a couple of years ago, it was important for me to use the real life aspect of the smart contract. So obviously we're selling a a collectible, but then I wanted it to have that real life element. And so when people minted V friends back in May, 2021, it came along with a ticket to three years of this South by Southwest meets kind of Coachella type of like what I call like a pop culture, cool conference, kind of like TechCrunch disrupt meets, you know, uh, (laughs) uh, so a lot of interesting crypto people there. I, I would say that what I'm in the last 12 months, probably the most interesting, actually the most interesting conversation I actually had was with Ben Leventhal, who's got a startup called Blackbird. Um, I believe that's right. I get weird with names sometimes, but it's in the restaurant space. And, you know, he was my co-founder in Resi, mm-hmm. a restaurant app that we started years ago. And it was interesting for me, like how he's thinking about how crypto payments and things of that nature really work for the future of, you know, hospitality that really stood out like, wow, you're going to do it. I guess the reason I'm answering that was there was a part of me that was like, wow, you're going to do it again. We, we won with Resi and you're, you're clearly going to, my Spidey senses told me he was going to win with that. Back to NFTs, you know, there's no confusion for anyone who's listening here that the videos I made, you know, a year ago, even longer ago of like 99% of NFT projects are going to zero, you know, I think fell on deaf ears in the hype Mm -hmm. of that crypto, you know, that NFT summer. But I think what's been really interesting is whether it's Luca from Pudgy Penguins or, you know, Danny Cole, who's an artist, who's really a true artist, who's running creatures. There's a lot of people still really building and really focused on the long term during the cloud of the overall space. By TechCrunch terms, it reminds me of when I first started consuming TechCrunch, right? Which was during the after effects of a big internet stock bubble where people kind of took their eye off the internet in 2002, three, four. And that 2004, five, six, seven, eight window was like so magical in web 2.0 which is where this kind of, you know, tech crunch world came from. And so um, I I think that there's a lot of really interesting people um, really creating right now in NFT land. And I think Luca stands out because he reminds me of me. He's thinking about it broadly, whether it's toys or experiences. It's like, hey, let's build a brand that's omni-channel, not just on chain. And I think that's the inevitable outcome for the NFT space. and I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, uh, you're actually one of the first people to mention TechCrunch on your own. I appreciate that. And I'm glad you read it and listened to it. And also on I your point argue, about, yeah. I'm no, sorry go to ahead. 
because I just want everybody <laughs> to hear this because I think there's a lot of youngsters who don't know this, but I would tell you that 2005, six, seven, eight, I mean, I read TechCrunch every day. I don't think, I'm not sure a lot of people listening really realize what it meant and I and I and the reason it's fun to bring this up right now is I really believe that that's what is about to happen in NFT land, like the voices, the publications, the conferences of 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027 mm -hmm. are are going to be looked fondly at in 2029, 2031, 2033, like this concept. Look, we needed to get out of the immaturity phase, right? The greed and the delusion of pets.com being worth a trillion dollars was similar to like a thousand different NFT projects thinking they were worth what they were worth as a collectible. But I think long-term, how is there even a world without digital collectibles? It's impossible. We're living digital and collectibles are like a real part of our society, <laughs> like in a really bigger way than I think people realize. For every person that collects sneakers and collects art and collects comic books and collects sports cards, there's another thousand people that collect marbles, matchboxes, and I don't mean the cars, I mean like literally yeah. antique belt buckles, vintage clothes. Like, like mm -hmm. I don't think people really understand how massive collectibles and identity of what collectibles you own or what fashion you wear or what car you drive or what watch you have. And so I think that we're in a really fun time right now in NFT land because I think 95% of the people left and I think the 5% of the people that build will, will feel similar to me of what I felt Michael Arrington was doing in 2005, six, seven. And I really mean this, Jack, like I read it 10 times a day. Like this was before you would get your news from Twitter and other things. This was RSS feed. You know, you're a youngster. Like a lot of people, <laughs> there were different technologies. Like I would literally go to the page 20 times a day just to mm -hmm. see if there was a new article, what was breaking news, who, what was going on with Flickr or Delicious mm -hmm. or Pig or Slashdot. Like people don't remember internet 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But I would say that that is one of the most important eras in internet history and I think we're about to see the same thing in blockchain as we get through this era and as we get more you know, clarity of uh, legislation and as humans get more comfortable with the technology, I, I think it's gonna be really neat to see what this space looks like in 10 years. Yeah, no, I agree with you on a lot of those points, Gary. And a lot of the conversations I have surrounding NFTs or the larger, larger crypto ecosystem is a lot of these things will fail. That's inevitable. We saw this with the dot-com boom. Even though I was young at the time, I do remember that. And yep. I think what you brought up with Pudgy Penguins is also super interesting what they're doing there and making these physical products that maybe people who aren't even into NFTs will buy just because they thought the penguin was cute. I spoke to Luca about this too, and we wrote about it. And I think there's so much opportunity for NFTs, for IP, all these different areas. And we could get into that in a little bit, but uh, just, we'll start with a uh, uh, shout out to Ben. <laughs> from Blackbird. Yep. And yeah, what were you gonna say, Gary? <laughs> I, I know this is audio, but you and I are on video right now while we record. Right. And like there's like right there on my shelf are the Macy's Toys R Us exclusive Be Friends. These mm -hmm. pants were out of control, just like the Olympics or Disney World at VCon. The mm -hmm. trading cards, just like Pokemon and Magic the Gathering are a huge yeah. part of the ecosystem. And, and just for the masses that are listening, over the weekend, Multiple people bought Series 2 vFriends, emailed me. Um, by the way, Gary at vFriends.com if anybody needs anything, <laughs> or anything get a job somewhere else. Like yeah. I, can, I love karma, so anyone listening. And emailed me that they didn't even know who I was six months ago, but they bought the toy at Toys R Us or their friend took them to Beacon because they just thought it was a conference. Mm -hmm. And now they found themselves buying a NFT, which they never thought they would. And I think for all the builders out there, that's what it's going to require because a lot of people bought Spider-Man's first appearance in a comic book for lots and lots of money in the 70s, 80s, and 90s because of the cartoons and the movies. Like Black Panther comic books are very right. soft out there now because of the movie, not because of the comic book. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point that a lot of NFT collectors and creators are missing. No, for sure. I guess to take a step back for those who are listening and don't know what V friends are, uh, it's a few collections 
on OpenSea. I looked at it before the episode and the flagship series one collection has some like simple sketches and drawings of NFTs with animal titles like Perspective Penguin, uh, Brilliant Barracuda, Polished Poodle, Monday Mole. Well, it actually says, fuck you, Monday Mole. Um, <laughs> that's the full name. Uh, but yeah, these aren't cheap either. The lowest floor price for the series one NFT collections is just over like two ETH at the time of recording. So Gary, to start there, what was the decision making behind this original collection? And how did you gain traction to begin with? Like, yeah, you have a lot of followers on Twitter, but even people with followers who launch collections sometimes fail. So how did you manage to make this collection stick and create this community? I did have a big audience and I think people listening know that, but to your point, I focused on the real life utility. Like the conference I just threw, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that hit your radar, but like, it's like a big deal. Like it's a real conference. Like it's Deepak Chopra and Jessica Alba and Tim Tebow and Mm -hmm. Scooter Braun and Dave Grubman. And, you know, like, like just a real, real, real conference, which more than justified why people entered two years ago. And then I have a long track record of being into collectibles and things of that nature and a track record of building successful businesses, whether Resi, VaynerMedia, you know, wine library. So I think there was some confidence on my operational capabilities. Um, As far as how I thought about it in 2018, 19, one of those two years, I was working on something called Workplace Warriors that I then changed to Workplace Pals. I only know that because my team just walked in last Friday to show URLs that they were asking me if I wanted to keep them. And I looked at workplacepals.com and I smiled because I was going to start toys, little desktop toys, Mm -hmm. of positive reinforcements for people's perspective. So based on the Gary V content I put out, I get thousands of DMs from people a month saying how much they dislike their job. And then one day after reading like five or six of them and going to the laboratory in my office, I walked by like 10 desks and every one of the desks I walked by, my employee had little Simpsons figures, little Marvel figures, little Flintstones figures, little Mm -hmm. anime figures. I was like, huh. And I just kind of came back and I said, what if I created like patient penguin or, you know, empathetic elf or these different names that, you know, didn't become the be friends names. And so I actually, before COVID started modeling and paying toy company uh, consultants to build out a toy line. I was going to literally launch a toy line selling six collectible figures because I love this stuff. I love nostalgia. I love the eighties. I love action figures and I wanted to try it. COVID happens, the world changes, as you know, and then the NFT thing happens and I go, oh my God, I want to do this. I've always wanted to have my own Pokemon, my own Sesame Street, my own Smurfs, my own Care Bears. Mm -hmm. This is my chance. And so I wanted to create these positive characters that can teach the world and scale the things that I'm passionate about, the things my mom taught me, the things that I believe in, positive traits and so I, it you know, back to your point, a lot of people make fun of me for what my V Friends series ones look like. And I understand that they're simplistic doodles that I personally drew, but I thought it was important that if I was really committed, which I am to trying to build a Disney, a Pokemon or things of that, a, a Marvel, well, I wanted it to start from my providence. I wanted to be the person that actually drew them. That if I'm going to be captain in this ship for 30, 40 years, and if I pull this off, I thought it really mattered that it came from my original drawings. There's actually even original drawings, you know, that I vectored into the digital asset. Mm-hmm. And so the reason I have a series one and a series two quickly behind that was I needed to turn the characters into more animations and expand into what I'm doing on YouTube kids or toys or trading cards like I just showed you. So um, that was the the genesis. And basically I... At first I thought I was building Disney. Now I think I'm building Sesame Street. And the reason I say that is, Mm -hmm. as I've been interviewing people to hire, I met a couple of people that worked with Jim Henson. And I really realized like a lot of his mission was to do a lot of good in the world. Like Fraggle Rock is something he created. And his brief to his creative team was stop war. That was literally the whole brief. Create a thing that stops war. And Mm -hmm. when the woman told me that, that worked with him, that worked on that, it really struck me because... V Friends' mission is to make people happier mm-hmm. in a world that I think is overly anxious because of lack of perspective. And so, um, you know, the I want to create a universe. And I thought the technology of NFTs was an incredibly fun, collectible way to start that. Right. So you're saying you made over 10,000 of these NFTs yourself? I drew, no, I drew 200. 
273, I think, was the first uh -huh. sitting. Uh, there's series two had 10 more, 268, 268, I think it was. I drew 268, mm -hmm. and then we created variations, one of ones, one of 20s. So Got there's it. a whole variation in series one. And then in series two, there was 55,555, because five is my favorite number. <laughs> and they're all unique with different poses and backgrounds, really starting the process of storytelling these characters. Right. And the V Friends OpenSea page says the project is about meaningful intellectual property. And we kind of talked about the digital collectibles on people's desks. I have some on my own desk. So I also, you know, I feel that sentiment as well. But what does IP look like to you and how can it evolve for both V Friends and the broader NFT community over time? Well, I mean, I think about this like trading cards and, and video games and, and comic books. I mean, the world has made this very easy for us. Like we have seen endless things go from cartoon and toy form into motion pictures. Mm -hmm. We've seen things, I mean, wasn't it just a couple months ago that Super Mario was the number one movie in the country that started as a singular character in a game called Donkey Kong in 1982, right? The man trying to save the princess was a man <laughs> named Mario in 1982. Here we are 40 years later and it's the number one motion picture in the world, I need people to hear me nice and slow. When Donkey Kong came out in 1982, 81, that range, video games was a new genre. The arcade was a seven year phenomenon at that point. You know, and like, and a new technology. And like, when all the arcades closed in the late eighties, people were like, oh, that was a fad like the arcade, but obviously went to the home entertainment system with Atari and Nintendo. I, I, I just need people to wrap their head around this. A single man in very, very 8-bit form that was going against this Donkey Kong, 40 years later was the centerpiece of a movie doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue on a weekend box office. Uh, Glowworm. Rainbow Bright, Transformers was a toy that was made and then used the 1980s framework of cartoons to build demand and now has had 20 motion pictures, right? Harry Potter was a book written for kids that could have flopped, but didn't, and became the backbone of intellectual property that not only has had, Jesus, a dozen films that have really mattered, but I mean, mm -hmm. people have Harry Potter pajamas right now in the world. So- yeah. You know, for me, I was, I'm 47. I'm very affected by the 80s. Flintstones vitamins and cereal with characters on it and Saturday morning cartoons and after school cartoons and video games and trading cards. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I think that it's very clear to me what intellectual property is, which is it starts in one form mm -hmm. and then it can go to many other places. What I think is unique about NFTs is if it starts as an NFT, what the affirmation of a decentralized blockchain from a technology standpoint allows is in 29 years, I can actually see if somebody minted a V friend mm -hmm. and has never sold it. That is technology that Marvel and Hasbro and Pokemon can't do. Mm -hmm. By starting my intellectual property digitally on decentralized servers on a blockchain in crypto form, it allows me to do unique things, <clears throat> right? which is really neat. Now we do need legislation. We do need clarity from the world, but like, it's really cool to imagine if there's clarity that in 30 years, I can have a 30 anniversary thing mm -hmm. and only 177 people are invited to it because they were the people that had diamond hands the whole time yeah. and XYZ. Like, it's so neat. It's so yeah, incredible. It's like, it's a member yeah, actual proof yeah. of transaction and ownership. Oh, yeah. I agree with that 100%. And I think that's something that we'll also see evolve in other luxury industries like watches, wine, whatever it may be, like even designer bags. I think those need that because when I go and buy a vintage bag, I want to make sure it's real. And I'm sure with you, when you find someone who owns a V friend and they say they've had it for years, like you could easily just go look that up oh, and verify God. that. It's, it's incredible. Like the concept mm -hmm. of everything getting digitized, sitting in exchanges, then if you actually want the physical item, you have to burn it. Like think about like a luxury bag. A lot of people collect them to never do anything with them. Yeah. So for 
if you're that person with a Chanel bag that's incredibly rare, you send it, you never need it, but imagine then you call it and you wanna wear it to the Academy Awards, you having to burn the NFT mm -hmm. to actually take it. And then when you resubmit it, it has to get authorized by Chanel that it's real, not fake. Like provenance and truth and clarity and non-manipulation of assets is now achievable and that's remarkable, not to mention storytelling and loyalty and membership and access. Mm -hmm. Again, we're still in the phase where we need regulation to give us, you know, we need, I mean, we don't have crypto laws in the US, the UK, Canada. Like, so I'm excited about like the next two, three years, just like the internet acts of like the early 2000s. Once people have full clarity, the innovation is going to explode. And I think all our, all us creators are really excited for that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out, especially with uh, the regulatory conversation, which I didn't really plan any questions for that. But if we want to go into that, we can later. <laughs> Honestly, that one, like when people ask me questions about that, I'm like, I'm just, I don't really even have any thoughts other than I just mm -hmm. can't wait for us to have it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, like where, you know, like to me, what's really interesting though, is going back to where we were a few minutes earlier, is this concept of what is the 1% look like? So I think about contemporary art, right? You think about contemporary art hitting the scene, 40s, 50s, 60s. And I think a lot about like, sometimes like, actually I did it this weekend. This weekend, really mellow weekend after family time, you, you get a little downtime to yourself. And the amount of joy I had scouring the internet, looking at artists, one of one pieces, and literally sitting there with my own subjective eye and my collectible background, trying to figure out, literally sitting there with a glass of wine, saying to myself within my own head, who could be Jackson Pollock? Who's Andy Warhol? Like where, where are the needles in the haystack? Because I know already that in 20 years, some of these people's stuff is gonna be so collectible and it's like fun. It's very high risk, high reward because I really do believe it's a 1% game. Like I believe 1% of the artists and IPs that are navigating right now in NFT land will be in that place in 20 years of demand, mm -hmm. but it makes it fun. And especially for the people listening here who grew up on comics or collectibles and any sneakers, video game collecting, posters, vintage clothes like you've got that bug in you and i i enjoy it quite a bit mm -hmm. no 100 percent. okay gary we're gonna move into a segment that i do called rapid fire Let's and you just answer one word answers yes no i think most of them actually elicit a response so maybe not yes or no's eh, there's a few anyways let's get into it first one you've invested in twitter venmo and facebook you go back in time and can only invest in one of them which are you picking facebook I've heard you want to buy the New York Jets. Do you think that's actually a possibility? 100%. By what year? I don't think of it in those terms, but I'm just <laughs> hard to try to get an at-bat. Okay, in the future. Should all NFT collections expand their IP? No, because I don't think everyone's capable of that. And you have to be self-aware of what you're good at or not. But I do think it's something everyone should consider because I do think it, it causes a lot more opportunity. Do you think NFTs will actually become mainstream? I do, but I don't think collectibles is going to be the way. I think it's going to be ticketing. I think it's going to be certain contracts, title insurance, things like that. I think I think in 20 years, we used to call the internet the information superhighway. Yeah. And that was because people thought of the internet 30 years ago as going to the library and doing research. And today we know the internet for a lot more. I think collectibles is a part of the NFT ecosystem, but I believe in 20 years, the concept, when people hear the term NFT, kids that are born today that are 20 years old in 20 years, they're not going to default to thinking it's a collectible. They're going to see it more broadly. Yeah. Like we saw internet-based companies and everyone's right. an internet-based company now. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Yeah. What is your favorite NFT that you own? Uh, I own a, uh, a ape. Uh, crypt, uh, crypto punk. And so I think crypto punks is my favorite project. It's kind of like mm -hmm. to me, the alpha of like this whole era. Mm -hmm. um, and in that collection, there's a very small amount of apes 
Um, and I own one of them. I think there's 27 or 18. I don't remember the exact number. And um, to me, that is like the Genesis project that created the genre. And so I'm really proud of having that. On estimate, or if you actually know the number, how many NFTs do you own? I actually don't have a clue. I think um, <laughs> I, I think from a, you know, don't forget the amount of people that right. things into your account. Not the airdrop ones. Yeah. yeah. The ones that I bought probably... Let's actually try to figure this out. Maybe a thousand. You know, feels feels right. <laughs> I'm really, right. really, really into it. Yeah, no, for sure. What's an NFT collection you think is underhyped? That's a good question. You know, the truth is that's really hard because I don't want to create speculation. And I'm also in such a cocoon with my own self right now and V friends. I'm so hyper focused that I have not done a good job keeping an eye on it. But I will say this. I do think, I believe a collection similar to Creatures by Danny Cole is like mm -hmm. the thing I'm looking for back to this weekend. I do think there is, there are some artists who made NFT collections in 2020, 21, 22, 23 that are just actually great artists. I am a great, I would like to think I'm a very good entrepreneur that knows mm -hmm. how to build a brand and understands consumer behavior. But I think there's people that are actual artists that if NFTs never came along, their paintings, their sculptures, their art would have still been a thing. Mm -hmm. Danny Cole is a kid that I, like Brooklyn hipster, like at a central casting, right? Brooklyn hipster, grew up in Jersey, like very unique, very creative. Like every time I interact with him, I'm like, that's just a lot of creativity projecting to me. The similar mm -hmm. things to like Kid Supa or like, Jerry Lorenzo, when I think about fashion brands and that are just art, artistic and creative based. And mm -hmm. so whether it's Danny Cole and Creatures or not, if people here are like looking to do research, finding someone who's like actually an artist and will always be an artist, like the internet and blockchain can be banned mm -hmm. by the whole world. And the next day they're painting or making a sculpture. I think one of those collections is under, very underhyped. All right. That was a pretty long response for the rapid fire, but we'll let you have it, Gary. <laughs> I apologize. I completely forgot okay. the rapid fire. Sorry. Okay. Last like, one. Last one. Like, yes ahead. or no. Do you think there are too many NFT projects out there? No and yes. No, because I think creatives should be creative. Mm -hmm. Yes. If people are worried about like supply and demand and having their collectible have demand, there's not enough demand against the amount of supply. And I think that will be a forever game. Just like there's too many comic books, too many sports cards, too many sneakers, only the 1% ever have that true demand. And I think people put all NFTs into a bucket instead of understanding it. I know that was long answered, <laughs> but I want to give value to the listeners. Yeah. People can't see the video as Gary mentioned, but I'm smiling. So that's why he was like, I know it's long, uh, <laughs> but I did ask you, Gary, if you think NFTs will actually become mainstream and you answered yes. What would it take for major NFT collections to actually gain mainstream adoption, not just from the crypto community, but from people in a general sense? We talked about this kind of at the beginning, but I wanted to dive a little deeper there with you on that. Uh, clear legislation from the US and Europe, which mm -hmm. then will allow entrepreneurs and creators to know what they can and can't do. Right, so it's like protection which, in a way. Which will then allow them to build very scalable things over time and then just a matter of time because the blockchain is that profound of a technology. Mm -hmm. It will be integrated into gaming. I'm sure you, based on what you do for a living, I saw this headline over the weekend or last week, excuse me. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Grand Theft Auto is rumored to be integrating crypto potentially in their game. Like that's just inevitable. Like mm -hmm. Madden 2K, the next Zelda. Like it once it's clear, everyone's gonna do it. Just like mm -hmm. credit card legislation. We needed internet legislation. We need clarity. We're that early and people don't realize we're that early. And so I think that's the punchline there. Right. And I have a question for you on looking at NFT collections. We, You've said that majority of them will fail. I agree with that. Or not fail, but they won't gain massive adoption. What do you think collections are getting wrong today? And what are some of the opportunities that most NFT collections haven't tapped into, but should? It doesn't have to be IP because then not all of them should. No, but I think this is where you nailed it at the at the tippy end. Until mm -hmm. you fall in love with Batman, no Batman item on eBay has any value. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. True. Like I have a job over the next 40 years to make people fall in love with practical peacock, right? To fall in love with empathy elephant. And I think that requires what I'm working on. Like this kid's book I'm writing right now, right? Mm -hmm. Like I need that to be a commercial success because the two characters that are featured in it then become interesting to people. Nobody gives a shit about Deadpool until they do. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about, you know, Yogi the bear or Papa Smurf until they do. And that creates broad storytelling. And so, you know, I think what people are missing and what is required is people falling in love. And that happens through music, fashion, video games, trading cards, collectibles, board games, you know, cartoons, animated, you know, shorts, YouTube kids, mm -hmm. Netflix, social right. media. Uh, it goes like, on and on. It, yeah, it goes on and on of like what we know. And so that's what happens. Right. And with uh, the idea of V friends, what has been something that the collection has maybe messed up on not understanding their community well? And then with the positive spin on it, what has been some of the biggest wins so far? I, I think when I was saying 99% are going to zero, mm -hmm. I should have also been like, and by the way, I know like mine's going well, but like there's going to be a lot of trials and tribulations as the macro you know, market affects everything. So I think that's the misstep of like, there was opportunities for me to like latch on to my own project um, and just like talk about how things happen. Like when trading cards are lower in demand, even Michael Jordan rookie cards are not in the same mm -hmm. place they are when there's a lot of high overall demand. I think the positive spin has been things like VCon. I mean, I think what was very clear to everybody last weekend, not this last Memorial Day, but the weekend before at VCon, mm -hmm. In Indianapolis was like, this is real. This is forever. Like we're only two and a half years in and like I'm committed to this. And I, I think that a lot of people that are collecting or are intrigued by or enjoying the process of watching um, appreciate the, the long-term like commitment. And I right. think, uh, you know, there's just a very good sense of like putting my head on the pillow, knowing that this is something I'm going to work on forever. And I think a lot of projects have done that poorly. I've been stunned by how many people have spoken to like, this is what I want to do forever that are now behind AI startups. I was, I was going to say, you're yeah. going to say AI. <laughs> I just, I can't believe how many people. Um, yeah, pivot. Pivot is amazing and required. Not mm -hmm. after you said you were going to do this forever. Yeah, maybe abandon is a better word. Yeah, I just think it's, that's right. I think now look, there's things to be done back to Pudgy. Like a lot of these projects I think should sell to another founder and let somebody else drive the brand. Um, but for me, like this is something I've always wanted to do my whole life. Like I've always wanted to have something like this. So I'm like really excited about it. Mm -hmm. When you look at V Friends in the long term, what do you want it to be known for? Or what's a word that you want people to associate it with when they think about it? Positive. I really want to leave a positive impact. I really, really, really aspire to a Sesame Street Disney reality. Like I really do think I can leave a very positive impact on the world. Think about this, Jack, this will make sense to you. Like the Gary Vee of my career is like the most selfish and selfless thing I do. It's selfish because personal brand leads to opportunities. I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. I understand that I've been able to invest in companies. I get relationships out of like, hey, Gary Vee's cool to me. I want to know him. Let's do something. But the amount of money and hours and time and effort I put into like trying, like think about the content I'm putting out. It mm -hmm. really is borderline therapy, guidance counselor, high school coach, grandma. Like I'm very proud of the things I talk about. There, you know, I am one of the louder advocates for kindness being a seat at the table for hardcore business. I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm a human. And not everybody likes me, my style, my the way I communicate. But with V friends, if somebody's like, oh, I don't like Gary, or like I can't show Gary's videos to my kids, he curses. Well, they can show patient panda videos to their kids. And so, like, and then even when I age it up, right? Batman comes in five-year-old form, but Batman has rated R movies in the theater. I aspire before I die to have a rated R movie about one of my characters because she or he character is cool but the underlining story underneath it will be to like have a positive impact whether that's about accountability or competitiveness is like i'll give you a good one i think demonizing competitiveness has really hurt our society i think the concept that there's no winners when you teach that to nine-year-olds or giving everybody a trophy has actually hurt a lot of people and it's led to a lot of 
Gen Z, early 20s anxiety because they're scared of losing so much because they were taught that it's bad when it's just a part of life. It's not bad or good, it's just life. Right. And so like, I think about these stories, these narratives. And so I want everyone to think of V friends. When I die, like in the obituaries and like if, if people are talking about it, which I aspire to, like I know I'm only gonna get 24 hours and then everybody will move on with their life. I'd like people to say like the V friends thing was a really good thing he did. Like, you know, my my grandchild right now is better off because she consumes V friends content and I want it to have a massive positive impact. Right.